kingdom polemics exist to equip the church for battle against the kingdom of darkness in light of the particular threats of our day. Kingdom polemics is about taking the cosmic Christological concepts of the Scottish Reformed and connecting it to the ground. Hello, Kingdom Polemics audience. We are having another interview style uh, conversation with Pastor Mark Jones. Like usual, there's a lot of you who are very familiar with the people that come on here, and a lot of you are not. And so we bridge those two people together in these conversations. And I'm going to have um, uh, Pastor Mark talk about something that he's written about and uh, written about in a way that actually has been read very, very widely uh, as the books that he's written. A lot of people have thought through this conversation through through his material. Even I have a long time ago, I uh, read it and um, still have it. And uh, it's the issue of antinomianism. The lawlessness that is a reality, not just in strange uh, theological circles and various segments of uh, evangelicals, but it's very much also something that we'll find in, um, in our circles of the Reformed strand. And so this conversation for me um, is a very old conversation, but I feel like it's a very relevant one in our particular point in time. For many reasons, so we're gonna we're gonna talk to the uh, the Jedi Master of Antinomianism. <laughs> but why don't you uh, give us a, just a, a brief bio of yourself, Pastor? Well, I've been um, pastoring at Faith Vancouver Presbyterian Church uh, for fifteen years, and uh, we we now have actually two sites because we're we're uh, attempting to plant a church but the site we started up starting to grow faster than the mother one so it's it's a bit of a weird dynamic so we are um navigating that which is exciting and i try to do a little bit of writing on the side uh as i'm able which has been a, a blessing my church has encouraged me in and um uh, i also try to travel um a little bit here and there especially internationally since america's got plenty of good Teachers and preachers and professors, I, I usually end up going to um, countries where others don't typically go. At least that's what I'm told when I get there. And um, I also coach uh, soccer teams just to have a, a break from the the world of theology. And uh, it's it's kind of a nice way to be in the community, to be involved in young people's lives. So that, and I have four kids and a wife. Uh, and um, yeah. That's pretty much all that's somewhat important about me. That's, well, the soccer thing is interesting. Uh, I, I, I have talked to you more about that because my son is uh, really into soccer. We're, we're always watching, uh, you know, European soccer and Champions League and and the um, the league in England and all that. I forget the name of it. Premier League, and, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, the Premier yeah. League. We have we have all those channels so we can keep up with that. And uh, it's hard to be someone who keeps the Sabbath. And um, and have kids in soccer, you know, it's been a challenge uh, for yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, especially the if your kids are good and, and get better, yeah. the, the challenges are are more difficult. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, he's he's not. Yeah, he's pretty good. Um, and and so we've we've like had a we've gotten knocked out of different like uh, club situations because they were like, yeah, you have to be able to travel you know, Saturday to Mondays and we're like, we can't do that. And they're like, well, too bad. You know, oh. but we finally, we, we finally found a team that is okay with it, but I don't know. It's, it's always an awkward thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we, I, I love, I love soccer. My son has made me love soccer. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's an amazing sport. Harry reader uh, said, it's a, said it's a communist sport. He, he didn't care for it. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, it's, I, I love it. It's, uh, I, I, I kind of became a Christian um, out of a soccer context, but I, I've returned to it and hoping to redeem the coaching aspect and ministry aspect that I can show. But I also have to make sure I behave myself uh, coaching, which is hard because I'm 
quite passionate. So uh, people go, that guy's a minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no. Yeah. you. Sh- I mean, I'm like that too. With my son, I'm on the sidelines and um, I'm talking to him and I'm not being disrespectful or controlling him, but you know, I, I, I tell him what he needs to be doing in the game. Like if you're playing soft. I'll tell him you're playing soft. Uh, and uh, people look at me a little cross-eyed. Yeah, when we train, we train pretty hard. I'm trying try to try to make you tough, you know, but not not a uh, you know. You're gonna do something. Yeah, do it, you know. But yeah, soccer is a lot of fun. Um, all right, so you wrote uh, this book um, about Antonio a while back, and I guess my question would be, what what specifically or pastorally prompted you to write on that particular topic? What what were the things that hit the nail on the head to have to write something about this and put it in print. To be perfectly honest, it was uh, Tully and Chavidjan's ministry, it, uh, and it was it was getting quite a lot of um, at least visibility, and and you know it was through blogging that he was you know kind of writing. I think back then for the Gospel Coalition, and he he kept sounding. He kept sounding these notes about the Christian life and grace and justification, and and I knew it was just terribly off center. It was, it had like the appearance of reform theology, but it it clearly wasn't when it was all said and done. So, I wrote, I think, a review of his book, Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything, and uh, it it really showed me that people were buying into this on mass, like they loved it. And I thought it was pastorally disastrous in the long run. It was kind of like drinking a Coca-Cola, you know, it was like, oh, this tastes really good. And, but, you know, drink enough Coca-Cola and you're going to kill yourself. So um, that urged me to, to deal with it, at least from a historical and theological and pastoral perspective. So that's why I wrote the book. And thankfully, PNR were willing to take on a, 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 at the time, controversial topic, but over time, I've I've really witnessed its its long term blessing to pastors and the church, and uh, so I'm not unhappy about writing it at all. Though there were times where it was a bit touch and go with just the response. Mm-hmm. Do you? I guess how long ago did you? When was it published? Uh, good question. I I just kept a copy by in case I had to find that out. I don't even remember to be uh, 2013. Wow, ten years ago. Okay. Would would you say that has a conversation? Do you has a situation that prompted that? Do you think it's the same? Do you think it's worse? Do you think it's gotten better? Like, how would you, looking back now, ten years, see how the in the obviously like the visible church is is very broad in those ranges, but just generally speaking, mm-hmm. where, where do you think we are in light of ten years past? It's tough to say because I don't think that in the reform circles we're having as many sort of intra reform debates anymore. Like, you know, I used to um, blog and, and, you know, we kind of have a few scraps, but I mean, I didn't see them as a huge deal. Some of them, it was just like we, we decided to fight about things that we thought were important. But now that tide has shifted so quickly to instead of Christians, usually having a little spat here and there um, about theology. I feel like, at least in my context in Canada, that it's Christians are having to band together a lot more against the world with the transgender craze and all these other things. So I find there's less, at least, outward discussion on antinomianism and, and that type of doctrine, and more we're taken up with sexual issues right now, which of course is a, is an offshoot of of antinomianism in a sense, but it's it's different. So there seems to be a bit more, um, at least joining together uh, in certain ways, and maybe that's a good thing. But I I don't notice it as much. And I think with Tolian's you know um, way in which he he fell publicly, and and just how he's tried to continue, and Mark Driscoll and guys like that, I think some people are kind of seeing the the dangers of that theology and its impact on how people live yeah yeah i guess it's it's interesting because i feel like antinomianism it it has a way of disappearing in certain 
expressions and then reappearing in others. Mm -hmm. And so the, the formal official particular dialogue with that term is, is, yeah, it definitely isn't as, as popular as it was uh, years ago, but I feel like it, it's, it's resurfaced, I believe, in the creation conversation, uh, the missiology conversation, the gender conversation, you know, the, the issues of officers in, in the church and, and all that stuff. I, I feel like it's, it's, it's very uh, alive and well um, in, in those particular situations, though it's not, it doesn't have like the particular expressions that, that, that we were talking about before. It has many ways of expressing itself. And I guess one, one good point to add to what we're talking about is how have you seen in the past and how do you even see now, like in the reform, because I feel like every, every denominational strand or, you know, kind of like groups of people that are Christian, they have their own ways of expressing lawlessness. What would it be a particular way that someone who would be in the confessional reform world, like how would they show the symptoms of, of having a, a lawless spirituality? Because we do it a little bit different, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's fair to say it's not only, you know, probably particular to do- denominations, but also even areas. So, you know, I don't pretend to be a, an expert by any means on how Southern culture might manifest certain traits versus Canadian, Western Canadian culture versus, you know, North, Northern American. Um, I, I think there could be some, some differences there, um, you know, because cultures do have their own ways of, of approaching um, just how they interact and stuff. So uh, I think I would take into account cultures. I would take into account denominations and, uh, it seems to me that, you know, in certain reformed denominations, for example, you might find that some preaching is 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 thoroughly orthodox in the sense of what they are saying, but there is not really a whole lot of application in the preaching. It's not really um, to the heart, and maybe that's a reaction to preaching that they felt was just um, way too much application and not enough doctrine. So you you get those reactionary. Um, movements. Um, you might get some reformed places where uh, assurance is spoken of as this sort of, well, that doesn't help Christian assurance. And, you know, my response is, well, that may not help your version of Christian assurance, but if it's the biblical um, view, then you have to deal with that. And, you know, I've just finished writing a book, actually, which is a companion in a sense to antinomianism on backsliding and apostasy in the Christian life called Pilgrim's Regress. And I kind of look at some of these issues of, of can we warn um, people in the church about possible falling away and things like that. And I think there's some strains where it's almost anathema to even suggest that Christians in the visible church can fall away. And yet the scriptures are filled with so many examples in the Old and New Testament and warnings whether Hebrews or Revelation or, or the gospel accounts or Paul's letters, I mean, it's everywhere. So uh, I think, you know, it all just depends um, where you where you are, what denomination. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely still an issue. Um, I, I also tend to now qualify what I'm saying is I don't spend every Sunday in every church in America. I'm not omniscient and, uh, you know, I'm not ubiquitous. So when I have certain views, I go, this is what I sense is happening. But, you know, I, I can't really speak definitively on what's happening down in Florida, for example, because I, I just don't attend church down there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, some of the stuff you said was definitely spot on, not giving any moral imperatible direction. But you get you are kind of like just stuck in, you know, the, uh, the gospel indicatives. And we're just supposed to, by gratitude and affection, automatically be able to make the connection. So I see that. I kind of like vagueness. Um, and that's one of the things I've noticed with the redemptive historical movement and the law and gospel conversation. That I think it was good about it. That it, it, did re, it did recapture some clarity about 
you know, distinguishing the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, but, but I feel like it, it reduced every conversation to a, is this something I do or is this something that Christ has done? And yeah, kind of like, and never like, okay, now in light of understanding myself as justified, how do I then um, do something? And I, what I find intriguing about the catechisms in the Westminster standards is that 30, 15% is about soteriology stuff and 30 percent is about law application stuff somehow uh we miss that you know mm -hmm. um, but, but i also think there is um i don't know if you've noticed this but one of the things i've noticed in the reform world that i believe is a is a symptom of antinomianism is the tendency to have an orthodoxy uh that is not enforceable right i guess another way i would say it is that we don't discipline uh, people in our courts or in our churches uh, for for certain things, right? So I, I think a, a theology that is thoroughly orthodox, where you confess everything uh, about um, the law of God and 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 what we believe and what we what what we do, but you don't enforce it. Like you don't see actual, you know, application of you must do this or else kind of stuff. Like I've I've seen some of that and. Um, in the name of charity and graciousness. Um, that's, 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 that's one of the things that I feel like, I, and I don't know about you, uh, but in the PCA, one of the things that I, I'm constantly dealing with just in presbytery life is, are we going to actually enforce ethics or are we merely going to conceptually embrace ethics, but very, very selectively or apprehensively uh, not enforce it. And so yeah. I, I believe, yeah, I believe a, a life, a Christian life that is not enforced uh, by you know, by discipline, it's 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 really not yeah, the life really, that you're living. It's really hard. Um, we had a case in our presbytery where a church felt like, and the elders were courageous enough to call out a minister for basically never ever preaching anything that seemed to be an imperative or you know how we can you know live the Christian life, and when we brought him into presbytery to examine him it was like well he goes i agree with everything in the confession and you know i you know i believe all this stuff so how do you deal with sins of omission versus sins of commission it's really difficult to say well that's not enough emphasis or that's not enough right and so that's why it's so difficult is a lot of antinomian preaching is orthodox in what they do say usually it's just a lot of the things they fail to say or mm -hmm refuse to say and that's very hard to say okay you've done enough now um versus you haven't like what's the percentage right so it's it's a very tricky doctrine that's why historically it's been hard to to navigate because um there's just no you know you don't get given a, a guideline of how many imperatives each sermon should have right yeah yeah i heard, I heard this said one time uh by a pastor he's having so there was people in his church that were having issues with what he was preaching about sexuality and uh, you know male male and female roles and whatnot. And um, there were some people uh, in their church that was having an issue with it. And the members, what they basically said was, "We've talked to other pastors in the area, and they believe everything you believe, but they just don't feel the need to talk about it and and preach it, you know, publicly." And I was like, "That's interesting." So. You believe in the the Decalogue and its ethics about sexuality, um, you know, authority in the home, all that stuff. But but you never talk about it. And to me, again, like I, I think an ethical standard that you never publicly communicate in public. It, it's how, how would people how would people know that that that, that was an actual standard? Is this is, is supposed to be like a, this secret? This secret yeah. behind the scenes, um, yeah, yeah, we we hold that. We just don't talk about that. So I feel like believing something ethical according to the law of God, but not expressing. And obviously, I don't think you should have a sermon every Sunday about every single. But you should. People should know, right, about the seventh commandment, yeah, and, and the sixth commandment, um, and not articulating it publicly. Um, mm -hmm. I think it may be related to um, being selective about law. Um, I think I don't know about I don't know if you ever thought about this, but I feel like in the reform world, 
I'll just I'll just put it out there. I, I think there is a correlation between the doctrine of republication uh, and the issue of the, of the law of God, meaning that the Mosaic covenant is seen essentially as a covenant of works to show us our need for Christ. So all of the conditionality there about blessing and curses doesn't apply. You know, the, the judgments, right, that God rains down on the covenant people doesn't apply. Um, pretty much that was just a an interesting period, a apparent thesis in redemptive history to show us that Christ must be our law keeper. So the, all the others, all everything is just kind of like thrown out the window. Have you ever have you ever thought about that or, or made the correla- correlation between those two things? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a while because uh, you know that seemed to me to be a Orthodox Presbyterian Church debate, which it was. You know, they even wrote a study um, report on it, which I thought was very well done. To to be honest, uh, I thought it was a great report as far as reports go, and I would expect nothing less from the OPC because they are, you know, quite theologically inclined that way. It's not something that happens to be a big talking point in PCA circles. And if I said republication from the pulpit, I don't think anyone in my church, except for a few, would even have a clue what I was on about. Um, So on the one hand, it's a non-issue for me. On the other hand, I do see uh, there have been certain ways in which people have understood republication, and it's worried me that they do have a, a bit of a negative approach to uh, the law. But um, it's and you know there there are implications, right, for how you view. Now, I mean, the converse may be true. They would say, well, we have reservations about you know your failure to understand, you know this redemptive historical shifts and things like that. I mean, I've, I've heard the debates back and forth so often, um, but I, I, I have sensed sometimes there has been a, a very strong law gospel contrast, maybe too strong for my liking, that is connected to republicanism. And, mm. and that's a big issue, right, law gospel, because it's, it's not just affirming the distinction. It's what on earth do you mean by the distinction? Is it redemptive historical? Is it imperative indicative is it you know based off the canons of dort um who have a you know a different understanding is it or sinus is it owen i mean it's really a tricky um theological concept so you know there, there are issues tied to that it's just not something that even comes up anymore for me so it's funny that you raise that because i haven't thought about it for years it feels like yeah i guess what, what i've where i've seen it happen in in, in my places of of walking in and existing, I guess, if I could put it that way, is that the idea that that God blesses obedience mm-hmm. um, is is very much repulsive um, mm-hmm. to significant amounts of Christians. The idea that that God judges um, Christians um, for what they do, right? Whether it's yeah. he judges families, he judges churches, or even judges nations. Yeah, um, it's very and I and I. And I don't think people have like this very advanced republication theology, but it's more like this subtle innate dispensationalism mm. that sees the church in the Old Testament as not exactly being a paradigm for yeah. the New Testament church. Never mind, even though Paul says in First Corinthians ten these yeah, yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, uh, it, and I think. Um, you know, you zeroed in on something that's really quite crucial is the idea that God does bless us for our obedience. And, you know, in John chapter 14 and 15, it's really hard to get away from the idea that obedience commandments are important to Christ. But even in chapter 14, verse 21 and 23, it's like locus classicus um, text, verse 21, about, you know, the communion we enjoy with the Father and the Son is 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 actually increased in the love of complacency. The old divines used to call it. The Reformed theologians called it the love of complacency, where our obedience really does affect the the quality mm-hmm. of our relationship with God and His pleasure in us. And and they had a different term for God's unconditional love, which was His love of benevolence. But the love of complacency was a sort of um, conditional way of looking at you know how we live and what commandments we keep or do not keep really do affect. And so when David sinned, you know, we're told the thing that David did displeased the Lord. 
Um, but then in the New Testament, you have so many references to pleasing God, whether children or adults, um, and that's in connection with you know doing His will and, and keeping His commandments. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say there's any significant differences between uh, lawlessness in in history, like with the libertines, and lawlessness in the present? Would you see significant differences? Would you see some, I guess, what, what would be some connections and, and uh, differences between historic antinomianism and the, and the stuff we've seen more recently? Sure. I think the, the heart, the sinful heart is, is the same operator in a sense, um, you know, in all ages. And there's different manifestations. So, you know, the root principle is the same, I would say. Uh, a desire for us to to skim off God's law, to change God's law, to to not um, submit to God's law, etc. That's always there. How it looks can can differ. You know, the libertines. You know, a, a big issue for them was just being able to go to church and take the, the communion. Um, and you know, we don't really have people rushing into church to just simply come and take the Lord's supper today, but. Um, we do have other ways in which people, you know, have no problem living with uh, their boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, having sexual relations and, and coming to church and singing hymns, uh, which is a type of antinomianism, right? And um, so th there's different strands of it. There's also like the intellectual side of it where people can actually be quite godly in the way they live, but they'll still talk about God's grace and all of their... Um, beliefs which are antinomian, but by God's grace, actually, ironically, <laughs> um, they are still kept from that type of lifestyle. So even though they say certain things, they still live a, a very respectable, godly lifestyle. I, I have friends and even some pastors where I, I'm a bit in disagreement with how they might frame certain things, but they're still godly people. So there, there's a lot of, there's a big spectrum, right? And um, I think it's fair to at least acknowledge that there's practical antinomianism, there's like theoretical, mm -hmm. rational antinomianism, and, and then different manifestations where it could be down to sexual issues, or it could be down to, um, you know, Lord's Supper taking without taking seriously the body as it has been in some ages. Yeah, yeah. Do, what are, when you think about the psychology, maybe that's not the best word, but just the reasons for why people go here. What 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 have you been thinking through this issue for for quite some time? Why do people? What are the causes and reasons for people to to hold to this? And because I I think you said something recently about the about the range. I do some I do believe that some people are doctrinally antinomian. Like they are actually they they thought through this and they have scriptures and it's it, it's systematic, right? Mm -hmm. But but I believe that for other people it's it's very different. It's it's more well. I, I have a child that is uh, has a sexual issue, and therefore I'm going to pragmatically for emotional uh, reasons. You know. So what have you seen? Have been? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very fleshly appeal antinomianism. If you think about like if you can get the doctrine to line up with your behavior, can be excused then in a sense, and so. If you say doctrinally, well, nothing that I do will change God's love for me, which uh, there's a sense in which that's true. It's a sense when it's kind of utterly false. And so if, if that becomes your, your tattoo each day of how you live the Christian life, you may be also living a life where you are um, sinning and knowing you're sinning, but you have this view that it doesn't matter. It's not going to change God's love for you. So um, I think the psychology is is very much bound up with a fleshly way of understanding the gospel of God and a failure to actually appreciate that God's law will bring us freedom when it's kept by faith in the power of the Spirit, in thankfulness, uh, especially to what he's done. But there's a lot more freedom in loving your spouse than cheating on your spouse. It brings bondage. You know, breaking God's law ultimately will bring bondage and misery to one's life. Look at David's life after his sins. You know, Second Samuel is just a litany of problem after problem in his family. That's because of sin. So I think, you know, psychologically, you've got to get people to understand that it's, it's not actually worth it, um, antinomian living. 
And there's a reason God, you know, speaks so clearly and strongly against antinomian living in his word. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, here's one thing I, I've wrestled with in this conversation as I've talked to people. And they say, yeah, you know, lawlessness, is, it's bad. But, you know, changing the gospel is, is really, really, really bad and really serious. So, yes, we understand this is a problem. But in, in, the, um, in the categorization of issues, it, this is not changing a view of the resurrection. It's not changing a view of the nature of the atonement. And I've heard that as an argument as to why we should not uh, fiercely assault and attack uh, this issue. Like, how would you answer that? Uh, objection, and and I guess I'm kind of loading the, the loading like the assumed response is I do believe that this doctrine, though it's not of first importance like the death, burial, resur- resurrection of Christ, I feel like it, it has a roadway and an attachment to to very to many important Christian doctrines. So people kind of push this away because it's not first tier stuff. It's not like the nature of Jesus stuff. Um, But I believe it has a connection to a lot of things um, that are first tier stuff. And I believe even the, one of the things I say, God's not going to kill you for something if it's not important, you know? So yes, you're not changing Christology, but if God kills you for something, it's probably, it's probably important. Yeah. So how are you? Yeah. Lying to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you process that? I think, you know, to me, it's, it's just, a, a, you know, like, for example, I read, um, if you read First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and 3, verse 18, you see um, Peter is explicitly connecting the death of Christ with a certain effect. It's, you know, he died to bring us to God in 318. He died so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him who gave us. Paul will talk about it in those terms. So if you look at First Peter and you look at Paul's you know, everywhere, um, you see there's a, an effect where the gospel necessarily brings about certain uh, effects in the lives of God's people. One is peace with God, justification. You know, you have peace with God in Romans 5, but there's also sanctification. Um, and and that's a very obvious connection to the death of Christ. So if you were to undermine the importance of obedience, you are undermining what Christ's death has sought to accomplish, right? So it's really hard to not value one and then value the other and vice versa. So I think if you truly value obedience, you have to be driven to the cross. If you're driven to the cross, you will then value what Christ did to do. And that was to bring us to God, to bring us to live in obedience to him and so on. So it's really hard to even compartmentalize these things as though this is a third tier issue. I know we do talk about that, but I just look at the scriptures and say, well, when you preach those texts, you know, you, you can't avoid the obvious conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. So what I hear, I hear you saying is our view of the law is connected to our view of redemption. Our view of redemption is connected to our view of God, right? So adoption of God, then you have uh, Christology, soteriology. And then you have, you know, the, the Christian life. So if you, so if you, if you walk that backwards, if you have a wrong view of God, it will lead to a wrong view of redemption, which will lead to a wrong view of ethics and law. So I believe that your view of the gospel will be, though your life under God's standards is not the gospel, I do believe that your view of the gospel, uh, your, 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 your view of God's law as it pertains to you is mm-hmm. inextricably connected to your view of redemption, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. you're saying, and, and that, who, who, what is redemption? Well, it's, that's connected to your view of God. So I, I believe if Paul says the grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness, right? There is something about grace that is, leading into um, life, 
and something about light that leads you back into grace. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I believe you redefine the law, which is connected to the, to the gospel. In a sense, you're redefining your view of the gospel, which redefines yeah. your, your view of God. So I, I believe that it, it is not a first tier uh, issue, but I feel, I believe it's very much in the web and connected to that. Like kind of like what you're basically what you're saying. I'm just, just repeating yeah, yeah. the words. Yeah. yeah. I think the, um, you know, the, the, the divines, you know, there's ways of describing and defining the gospel narrowly, you know, where it's like pure, um, indicative in the sense of what Christ has done, but there's also mostly, um, in the reform writers, uh, a larger understanding of the gospel. You see it in the canons of Dort um, 514, where it says that the gospel contains even threatenings. And I think a lot of people want to talk about the gospel and the law, like do and done, you know, gospel done, law do, but that's not really how it's always been described. You know, John Owen, for example, and the Puritans will talk about the gospel as having commands Mm -hmm. because they're understanding it broadly. And so you have to be careful to distinguish like, are you talking about this narrowly yeah, uh, or yeah. broadly? And, you know, there was debate about repentance. Does it belong to the gospel? And Ursinus said it did. And, you know, I, people have a hard time then with their very narrow definitions to fit things like that in. And so it causes them a lot of trouble. And we don't really need to cause a lot of trouble. We just have to define our terms carefully and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're just looking, you're, you're observing things like you know, live your life worthy of the gospel, right? The o- o- ob- obedience to the gospel. And mm-hmm. you you see that there is a somewhat of a command in, in the conversation of the gospel without making the covenant of grace a covenant of works. You, there, there's, mm-hmm. a broad, there's a broader conversation yeah, the, the idea that like the law is imperatival and everything, so everything, every, law is imperatival and then everything gospel is not imperatival. Um, it, it, it's not as nice and tidy as, as some would make, right? Um, even, yeah. like, even the gospel commands you to believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> and repent and believe. And so what I, what I find is being someone who just, reads the Bible a lot and regularly and um, and just lets it just speak for itself will we'll help you not overstate and over speak over clear text. I remember one time uh, I said, uh, yeah, we, we should, you know, God, sh- there is, there is now no condemnation in Christ. So, you know, we should never shame a Christian for, for their sins. Like you shouldn't, you know, be ashamed because the gospel talks about us you know, no longer being condemned and, you know, removing our shame and guilt. And it sounds nice. And then you go to first, then, then you go to first, uh, is it second Thessalonians where it says you should not talk to him. So he feels shame. Yeah. You know, yeah, so, yeah. so that, yeah, yeah, just reading all the Bible and, um, you know, the, mm-hmm. all the texts and, and then thinking about them together. Like it's, it's important. It, it's important. Um, yeah. and, um, yeah. So even like the whole thing about assurance, you said, is our assurance in Christ or is our assurance in our works? Well, the answer is, is yes, because, um, the, the, the standards talk about our assurance being strengthened, not grounded, but strengthened, um, by yeah. the, the works that come from grace. And, you know, first, I mean, you have these texts like first Corinthians six, that's, says, do not get it twisted. Nobody who practices these things is in the kingdom of God, you know? So the idea mm-hmm. is like, if, if, if that is you, um, yeah. you shouldn't feel good about your state in grace. Not because your behavior grounds your state in grace, but there is an, an, an inevitable, necessary correlation between being united to Christ forensically and also mystically, right? Uh, being united to Christ in such a way where you, you not only died for you, but, but you died in him, Romans six, you know, so, uh, there, there is a, yeah, a whole Bible Christian is, is really vital to navigating these conversations because you can, you, everyone can find the little hobby horse verses, um, that say and unsay other things in scripture, right? 
Yeah, and our, our Reformed theologians historically, you know, they were not unaware of all these issues, and you know, they all deal with it in different ways quite quite well. And even the Puritans, as people forget, like they have some of the best treatments on assurance out there. It's 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 funny to me um, that you know Dane Ortland's book, you know, Gentle and Lowly, is basically drawing off Thomas Goodwin. Right, in terms of a lot of the theology he's trying to say about Christ's heart and compassion and all of that. So, um, you know, people are definitely um, being shortchanged on Reformed theology if, if they're not seeing that the, the doctrine of assurance, for example, is very Christocentric, historically speaking. And um, it, there's no real moralism there there's a few works here and there that i think probably a bit intense um but otherwise reform theology's been dealing with this for hundreds of years and and pretty pretty well i would say yeah yeah here's another a, a good question uh to ask what are some clever disguises of antinomianism like what is, how is it disguised to not actually be to to make you feel that it's not actually there but it actually is there yeah, I think people talk about, you know, glorying in the grace of Christ and God. And, and so they, they use a phrase that we, we should love. Honestly, we really should, you know, love the phrase, you know, the grace of God and the, the grace of Christ. Um, so when you talk about grace, you can, it's, it's sort of what is the meaning of what you're saying? Um, not just are you saying a phrase like a shibboleth, um, you know, the certain things you, you say, and it's like okay you're you're in you know you're saying the right things but i think we have to be careful you know what do we even mean by these phrases um you know god's god's grace in salvation that that's just disguising a possible antinomian theology it could even be disguising a type of legalistic theology you know when it's all said and done and there's not much difference at times between antinomianism and legalism but uh it does you know, sneak into the church by using orthodox phrases. And um, Anthony Burgess, you know, made that point, and so did many others that, you know, antinomians will, will use all of the orthodox language. It's just they'll they'll do different things with the doctrines than what was intended. Yeah. Yeah, so they'll, they'll, they'll use the doctrines of grace not to encourage you to holiness, but to make you feel good about you know, the opposite. And, and you know, what's interesting is, is yeah, you know, God's grace is very precious. Like when I've sinned, obviously I need to know that there is no condemnation and that going to Christ, I can be assured that he's going to forgive me freely and unconditionally, you know, when I repent and turn to him each day. Like that is, that's amazing grace. As, you know, Newton says, we can't, ever give up how amazing God's grace is in terms of our own preaching. And, and you know, every sermon I do, I, I, I try to make sure I'm rooting it in Christ and his death and resurrection and so on and being very Christocentric because I don't want those who are antinomians to ever be able to look at my preaching and say, where was Christ and where was the gospel and where's glory? No, we have to do it even better to show that it's 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 something we do glory in and something we do prize but that also means i don't have any shame in saying to people you know like you need to love your wife uh children need to obey their parents and and flesh that out a bit and not feel like embarrassed about that yeah yeah and, and i feel like the grace that reminds us that our sins are atoned for it it's never it's never simply that. It's listen, you're forgiven. Now, now stop it. So <laughs> it's not like you sin, you're forgiven, right? It's it's always calling us uh to to in light of that forgiveness to to turn away from that. But one of the things I've noticed too about how this is sometimes hidden is when we're having a conversation about virtue and righteousness. The phrase, like you said, shibboleth, comes, we need to, to show grace. Mm -hmm. As if discussing the law of God in a situation is somehow 
in some other stratosphere, you know? So like I, me, and, me and a fellow elder I've talked about this one time, we were talking about a situation and we're like, yeah, this person, um, this is what they're doing. This is how it's inconsistent with you know, what God wants us to do. And um, it needs to be corrected. And then all of a sudden there'll be someone in that, that room of, of leaders that says, yes, but we need to show grace. And, yeah. And, and it's almost like a way to to shut down the admonishment element of the conversation. It's almost a way to to soften it. Like yes, and one of the ways that God is gracious to us is by telling us that our behavior needs His grace to yeah. stop. Right. So it's yeah, like yeah. it's very. We need to show grace. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. but as if discussing the law of God and the requirements of God. Mm-hmm. is antithetical and competitive to grace right yeah yeah um, and you I, know anyone who's raised children you know you go into their bedroom after they've done something like hit their brother and you, you are you going to go show them grace obviously you're going to go show them grace you're not going to go tearing in and yelling and screaming you're going to sit down say hey you know like what you did was wrong and try to lead them to repentance and they're still being told of what they did was wrong. They're still being urged to not do that in the future, right? Repentance, turning from their sin. But you're also saying, if you confess your sins, he will forgive you. He's faithful. So, you know, showing grace is a big category. It's it's our disposition in how we speak. It's the fact that we're pointing to Christ. But it's also the fact that we're saying there's a better way than the way of the yeah. flesh. Um, and all of that is showing grace in a in a sense, right? So. Yeah. That's why I'm saying we don't need to be ashamed of, of the gospel and how big it is and how it's equipped to deal with all of our problems. Yeah, absolutely. An- another thing I've noticed as well in um, the way lawlessness can be disguised and uh, like subtly there but not op- overtly there is in the mortification, uh, viv- vivification conversation. So. And you've, I mean, I don't know. How, I don't know. Some pastors are really in the the side B uh, convo. Others are less. But hmm. I'm not sure how how much yeah. you followed. But what I've noticed is a lot of significant amounts of people will talk about saying, "Yes, the Christian life is a life of sanctification. Yes, the Christian life is a life of holiness." So they're not they're not these free grace people that are you know saying that. Yeah, we're just saying. Jesus, thank you for being a wretched person our whole life, and there is no walk into holiness. But what I've noticed is that what Paul says in in, in Ephesians 4, let the thief no longer steal, Mm. but then do its ethical opposite. Yeah, yeah. Work with his hands. What I've noticed is there's been a resistance to the belief that Christians. Because of indwelling sin, because of the residue of the old Adam, uh, we can't actually stop behaviors comprehensively um, and replace them with their opposite. So I'm always going to be uh, this person. And I feel like, now I understand, I understand like the, the way that conversation goes wrong the other way. But however, I, I have met pe- many people that believe because we're not glorified, that texts like Ephesians 4 are pie in the sky. Yeah, you know? it's a shame that, you know, people doubt our conformity to Christ. I know that, you know, there's small beginnings in this life when you compare it to eternity and tr- glorification of our resurrected bodies. It is small beginnings, but those small beginnings are still real beginnings and they're still Christ-like beginnings. and. So the whole point of predestination is so we're conformed to the image of Christ. And as we, by faith, behold the glory of God, we're being transformed into his image. It's denying that the purpose for which Christ came and lived and died is being realized in us, which is quite sad. Um, And again, being sensitive to the fact that indwelling sin is powerful and it is small beginnings in this life. It's still it's still something that we strive for and believe God will accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't beat people up anymore. You know, it's yeah. not like I, I'm not beating up people less. I don't do it. You know, I, yeah, um, I don't, I don't fornicate anymore. Yeah. You know, like, and I'm not saying that. Like, I'm just saying that there. Now, obviously, there's some things that I still do, right? 
Um, but but I think the idea that like I, I heard this said by somebody like sanctification is not hospice. You know where where your where your where your sinful desires and actions are just put in hospice yeah. until glorification. Um, and I, related to that, I, I, this is one of the things I've noticed in, in the Calvinistic world is people discover you know things like total depravity and the holiness of God and whatnot. And all of a sudden now, I, I hear Reformed people, and I know what they mean, but like I don't think they know what they're saying is they, they talk to, to Christians like they're, they're sinful, wretched uh, people, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, our, I, I know once I'm a, a worship, uh, worship guy, like, oh, yeah, our wretched, evil, wicked hearts, and, and we're sinners. And I'm like, what are you talking to? Like, <laughs> like who yeah. are you talking to? You know, because yeah. I read Ephesians 4. Yeah, I don't see like this Jekyll and Hyde, you know, there's this wicked, evil heart. And then there's like this good guy, <laughs> like it, it emphasizes the new man renewed. Right. And mm-hmm. and when we when we act sinful, we're not acting according to who we are. We're acting contra who we now are in Christ. Yeah, your identity is shifted. And that's why um, we're not actually totally depraved as Christians, because total depravity has built into it historically total inability, and that's been dealt with. So you can't call Christians totally depraved. But you know, our primary identity in the New Testament is is positive. There are times, you know, we're called, you know, like Peter will say, "Depart from me, I'm a sinful man." But overall, we're called not just children of God. We're called saints. We're called righteous. We're called like holy. It's children of light. It, the yeah the 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 phrases used to describe Christians in the New Testament are overwhelmingly positive because of our new identity than negative, even though we still deal with indwelling sin. So it's more like a foreign um, intrusion into our life, indwelling sin, rather than our core identity. Yeah, so. yeah, and I think too. Also, I believe a lot of Christians understand the co crucifixion co crucifixion element of our spirituality, but they don't seem to understand the co-resurrection ascension. So, so we understand the need for element. We, we understand the need of things to die because they're wrong. Um, but there's also the, you know, you are, you are participating in the inaugural state of, of, of the ascension, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and triumph. Um, and another and related to this too, is the tendency of, antinomianism subtle to express itself. I think we talked, we touched this a little bit, but I'll just bring it up again to express itself in not affirming the obedience of believers as pleasing and glorifying to God. Right. That's, 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 and that's, 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 that's a very subtle one because it, it sounds like you're being very theocentric when you're saying like, you don't, you know, it's not, it doesn't please God, doesn't glorify God because it's not perfect and you're not perfect. And so I, I feel like if you're regularly telling Christians that God is so holy that they can't please God, I, I feel like you're subtly promoting a lawlessness because they'll be, well, if I can't ever please God because he's holy and perfect and I'm not perfect and nothing I ever do is perfect, well, you know what, then then let me just not do anything. And so that actually is, Kevin DeYoung talked about this uh, a month ago. I heard him mention it. It's like, you know, you, you, yes, it's imperfect, but in the covenant of grace, in union with Christ, through faith, you actually please yeah. God. And when God said that Zechariah was blameless, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't hyperbole. Yeah. You know? no. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, uh, it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely, uh, what I would say, uh, a, a slight on God who prepared these good works in advance for us to do. And um, that is a slight on God's work in us. And now that's called sincere obedience by the divines. Um, it's imperfect, but it's still sincere. And for that reason, God accepts it and approves of it and is pleased by it. And that's that's just vanilla 101 reform theology historically it's not even a debate really um as far as i'm concerned scripturally or theologically in our history yeah i would agree 
um, a lot of these conversations are somewhat um, water under the bridge, but you may disagree with me on this. I have I'm surprised as to how many people in the in the uh, let's just say PCA, not not May Park overall because I'm not. Yeah, I know APC ARP guys and RPCA guys, but in the PCA, I feel like there's there's significant amounts of people that I I I, I believe sincerely lack depth and awareness in the tradition and um and part of that part of that is because certain figures and that are very popular and influential have this kind of like uh you know this new school this new this new school kind of like adapted modern progressive confessionalism that i think is really far from like the original but a lot of this stuff yeah i agree a lot of this stuff is it's very basic reform stuff, right? But um, I think a lot of people, I'm not saying everyone or, or most people, but a lot of people are very unfamiliar uh, with, with these things. You know, I, I, I talk, when I talk to guys about the law of God, I was like, have you ever, have you read the larger catechism exposition on the, on the Ten Commandments? Because um, what, hmm. what, you know, it's all there, you know, what you're saying. I, I, have you ever read it once? You're, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> like like yeah. one time. Um, all right. So I appreciate, uh, yeah, your thoughts really good. Um, and I guess we would close with what do you believe are the key essential remedies to this issue? Like what, what, what are the positive ways that a Christian or a pastor uh, can, uh, do something contra for the good of the, of the of of God's people in light of the, this particular issue. Yeah, I think in my book on antinomianism, in every chapter, I have like you know looking at the problem, the issue, but then I also have a Christ-centric approach to resolving it. So I think you know a robust doctrine of God, of Christ, of the Spirit. You know, getting our historical theology um, up to snuff. And and reading widely in in the reform tradition, and um, I think also just being a pastor. You know, at the end of the day, you need to be a pastor to people, see their issues, how they respond, understand different situations, call for slightly different approaches. But at the end of the day, you know the the gospel is the remedy to our problems. But understanding the gospel appropriately, so um, you know, it's not really a, a silver bullet approach. It's yeah, we must preach faithfully and worship well and have God's words driven into us in many different ways, whether we sing, pray, read, hear, and um, and have good friendships as well. Uh, you know, there's a, there's another way to keep us from antinomianism. And Proverbs are clear about this. You know, you. You walk with the wise, you walk with the godly, and um, you will be that. But so it's it's kind of a whole ecosystem approach from my perspective. Um, you know, good worship, good fellowship, um, sacraments, good reading, and, uh, and and you just bring those things together, and and also be humble enough to see that maybe you've made some missteps at times theologically and also in how you live, and ask God to to lead you into green pastures with, with what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the simple answer is, is you need to be in a healthy church that models this, yeah. that equips people under this. Um, and um, I, so if you don't have the uh, essential the essential organizing reality of, of a healthy church and leadership doing this. And it's, it's going to be very hard um, yeah. to, to, to materialize. I think that, and I mean, not to be specific about what you said. Yeah. I think one of the ways that I think one of the greatest places in the church for us to uh, combat this issue is the Lord's table. And so we do, we do it every week. And that means our services are really long. Mm. And um, the gospel is is the place where the gospel preach is is for everybody and, and everyone there. They can all hear it. But the Lord's Supper is a place where that covenant needs to be embraced, appropriated, 
um, comprehensively. And so every Sunday, like we're, we're reminding the people of God that this grace is free, but it comes with terms. It comes with consequences. It comes with demands. And so that, that tension of he did it all. And, and, and now there is, there is a requirement of you in light of that grace that will be demanded of you. Uh, if you play with it, I feel like that's, that's a really, Lord's Supper is a powerful place. I, I, I feel like to consolidate these conversations, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's the uh, simple term of fencing the mm-hmm. table. Um, and uh, you'd be surprised as to what, um, what it sounds like to receive the Lord's Supper in, in many, 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 mm-hmm. many places. It's, 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 yeah, uh, I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think uh, we got a, a good hour of uh, the conversation. This is something that we'll obviously talk about again. And um, it never goes away. It never goes away. No, no conversation in scripture ever goes away. It just recycles itself in different ways. And um, so, but for now, I think we've, uh, we've uh, done a good job informing these folks on it. So thank you for your time. Pleasure. Uh, pleasure. And uh, getting back to me and, uh, you are you on any uh platforms or podcasts or YouTube? Uh, or- no, I, I I just blog occasionally now for Reformation Twenty One again and Desiring God and uh, sometimes other places, but those are usually where they 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 ask me to write and um, you know just my my church website uh, for sermons and uh, and Amazon for books and you know I don't do Twitter cause it's just not good for me. Uh, so, uh, but I, I do sometimes have a little, uh, few glances at Facebook just to see what's going on in the world. So yeah, that's about it. Are hey, you got any new, uh, new writing projects coming up? Oh, uh, I'll just finish the Charnock one with Crossway editing that, but the book on backsliding and apostasy with PNR coming out in October called Pilgrims, Re- the Pilgrims regress. And, uh, yeah, it's looking at those twin, um, dangers of backsliding and apostasy in the Christian life and, and solutions to avoiding that. So that'll be October. Interesting. Interesting. Good. I, I think I heard this said one time, and uh, you can confirm or deny this, that every author has one book. He has one book that is uh, just worked out yeah. in different rooms. Is that, yeah, yeah. Is that, you said that's true? Uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'd like to think Knowing Christ was my, my one book that's somewhat useful. Um, God Is has done, has done really well, actually. Uh, it's on the attributes of God. And, uh, you know, the other, there's been some other ones that, you know, hit or miss. Some well, oh, no, what, I, what, I, what I meant by that, not you have one book, that's, but that all of your books, like they're... Oh, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. They're one conversation just developed and kind oh, of I broad. Yeah. that's what i maybe, meant maybe yeah sorry I, I get the other question so often that i uh just assume so uh <laughs> yeah i think i think that's right you know your systematic yeah. theology basically is, is is the same maybe it shifts a little here and there but um yeah they're all branches of of of, a, of, of the big picture so um yeah it's nice to tackle some of those branches and and prune them and and make them look nice if you can and uh some get cut off and uh but yeah it's uh it is one conversation in a sense yeah i get it well thank you for your time keen yeah. polemics thank you we uh we got a uh, mark jones on here short notice i appreciate it i'm sure you guys will benefit from the content grace and peace until the next time signing off